Satchel Paige, the famous baseball player, once asked this question. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? Think about that for just a minute. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? Would you be older than you are or younger than you are, depending upon your frame of mind? Let's apply that to our study tonight. How old would the earth be if we didn't know how old the earth was? You see, every time you go to a museum, you're told the earth is millions or billions of years old. Every time you open a book, it seems today you're told that the earth is millions or billions of years old. Every time you cut on the Discovery Channel or watch one of those specials that we like to watch, it begins by talking about millions and billions of years. And I know that there are those who have closed their eyes, and I know that there are those who have stopped their ears, and who want to imagine that this is not going on in our world. But I can't tell you over the last few weeks how many times individuals of this congregation have come up to tell me various things that they have seen or they've read, both those that are in school, those that are out of school, uh, have come up to tell me of things that they've said of evidence of evolution permeating our society. And so I, I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm not trying to make something a bigger matter than what it is. I'm simply trying to get you to take a serious look at how prevalent this is in our world to guard your children against this false theory. So tonight we want to talk about the age of the earth. Now, I will struggle to present this information. I, I don't consider uh, this type of preaching to be the kind of preaching that I'm most comfortable doing. I don't have the background that I'd like to have in being able to present this as well as others can. And so I struggle to do it, and yet I believe it needs to be done, and so I do the best that I can. As I study through this inf information, I'm amazed by how much information there is out there. And so the greatest part of the struggle is, how do I condense all of this information down and give them something that's meaningful? Give them something that is simple enough that they can see it and they can understand it because it's simple enough for me to see it and understand it. And yet, as I'm trying to do that, I realize that there are individuals out there who far more qualified, far better able to present this information. And I wish they were here to do it. Uh, men like Eric Lyons and Kyle Budd and Wayne Jackson and others that you know of uh, who have spent their lives doing this. And it's so encouraging, isn't it, to think of Kyle Budd and Eric Lyons and some of those at Apologetic Express and how young they are and, Lord willing, how many years they will have uh, to defend the faith in this way. And you ought to be so thankful uh, that this congregation has supported those men, has supported that work, continue to do so. Uh, I, I don't know of, of works that are more deserving of our support, uh, given the common unbelief in our age, than what that work is. Uh, Brad Harib and some of the work that he's done, as well as well, uh, Focus Press, is it, so needed. And we are so blessed to be able to have a small part in the work that they're doing. And uh, they, they will be on our lectureship. Some of them will be addressing matters like this. Cal Butt uh, will be speaking on Sunday night of the lectureship, and he will be addressing the far country of atheism. Uh, some of you may recall that he recently debated uh, an atheist, evolutionist, and did an excellent job in that debate, and so he's well qualified to be able to come and talk to us about that. And others, uh, Caleb Colley will be here, and others will be here uh, discussing matters as well. So we can look forward to that. But tonight as we talk about the age of the earth, we begin by noting that evolution contends for an old earth. Uh, now, it's no mystery that evolutionists need time, lots of time. It is their basic contention that given enough time, anything can happen. If you just give them enough time, then they believe that all of these mutations, all of these transformations, all of these movements from nothing to something can take place. Given enough time, a monkey can become a man, they would contend. 
Now we know that that's faulty reasoning. We know that, that there's a major flaw in that kind of a thinking because time alone does nothing. But that is their contention. And time is certainly the hero of the evolutionary plot. If there is a hero in their plot, it is time. And they have lots and lots of time by their own giving to be able to bring this about. Now, the numbers will differ just a little bit, but these are general numbers that are given by evolutionists. The universe is believed to be some 20 to 30 billion years old. Uh, the earth is somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.5 billion years old. Man is relatively modern. He's a Johnny-come-lately, if you will. Some 100,000 years ago, uh, he appeared on the scene. Now, you'll find that in your science books at school as you see the layout of the geologic timetable, the geologic column, and you see the various ages and the hard-to-pronounce names that they assign to each of those ages and what organisms were supposed to have been prevalent in those ages, leading all the way up to the top of where man makes his appearance, relatively recent. In fact, if you were to look at that whole column of everything that has come into being according to evolution from the simplest to the most complex man being near the top of that column is only about one one thousandth of the time period made up within that column and so he really is a very small portion of that type uh, of an understanding of the earth now there are a number of problems with the geologic timetable namely is it doesn't appear that way in the earth uh, that is what scientists imagined it would look like, and so that is the framework with which they go and they look into the earth. And sometimes places like the Grand Canyon and other places are suggested as showing huge layers of earth to suggest that this column actually exists. We've talked about some of the problems. We'll talk about some of the problems later on. That's not our purpose in, in this lesson. But our purpose in this lesson is to simply suggest that the dating that evolutionists give to this geologic timetable to this column going back 4.5 billion years simply won't hold true. The idea that, that man has only been around for 100,000 years based upon evolution and, and, and yet we will find certain artifacts, we'll find certain things that are further back in time that clearly were put there, were made there by man, simply shows us that evolution, th evolutionary theory is wrong. And the evolution evolutionary dating methods are wrong. They missed it somewhere. And it's easy to see that they missed it somewhere. It's just a matter of trying to determine where they missed it. But there's no question that they missed it. We'll be able to see that. One example that Bert Thompson gives in some of his material is the example of an evolutionist by the name of Albert G. Ingalls. It may remind you a little bit of Little House on the Prairie. I think there was an Albert Ingalls on that show as well. But this Albert Ingalls was a ge geologist in Kentucky. He was the state geologist, geologist in fact, uh, around about uh, 1840. Now, as we think about this, this man, he was, of course, in a coal state. A lot of coal in Kentucky, a lot of coal in West Virginia and through that area, through that region. And so in examining some of these coal mines and coal uh, discoveries, there were found human footprints, at least what appeared to be human footprints in that coal. Now for us, that isn't all that surprising. It doesn't shock us. It doesn't create a stir within us at all. But for an evolutionist, it does. Because coal was supposed to be laid down during the Carboniferous period, which was some 250 million years ago. 250 million years, and yet in that coal are what appear to be human footprints. Now remember, man's only about 100,000 years, very top of the geologic timetable, but somehow those footprints got back 250 million years ago. Now how did that happen? Now, there's something wrong with their theory. There's something wrong with the way that they've dated things, if that is to be true. Now, he wrote an article. He was asked to write an article by Scientific American. You may recognize that name even today. And in 1940, uh, he wrote this article. I think I said 1840, 1940. And the article was entitled, The Carboniferous Mystery. 
Now, the mystery is, how do footprints that appear to be human footprints appear in an area of the earth, in the level of the earth, in strata of the earth, that is supposed to be 250 million years old? How does that happen? That's a mystery, isn't it? If you believe in evolution, it is. If you believe in the dating of evolution, that's a mystery. How did that happen? Well, here is what he says in trying to explain away that fight. And by the way, this has not been found just one time. This has been found multiple times. Coal is a tremendous evidence of the fact that evolutionary dating is wrong. And if you want to prove that evolutionary dating is wrong, then you're going to find, find numerous cases that have been preserved in coal that show that. And it's interesting to me that, that it's laid out that way. God, in looking down through human history, was able to see the various things that we would use to heat our homes and cook our food and whatever, and there's evidence that's been placed there. For those who are honest, for those who, who want to discover it, to find it. And it's been found again and again. But here's what he said about this mystery. He said, if man, or even his ape ancestor, or even the ape ancestor's early mammal ancestor, existed as far back as in the Car Carboniferous period, in any shape, then the whole science of geology is so completely wrong that all geologists will resign their jobs and take up truck driving. Geology is a mess, isn't it? It's a real mess. Because it has a problem on its hands. How can this level of the earth, supposed to be 250 million years ago, contain human footprints? Something is awry. Something does not add up. And so I'm supposing that there were a lot of geologists that became truck drivers. That's a little bit scary as far as I'm concerned. If there are those that, that cannot look at the layers of the earth and, and make the proper judgment concerning how old they are, how far apart they are, then I don't necessarily want him and an 18-wheeler on my bumper. And I want a lot of distance between him and me. If he's no better than judging space or distance than that, there, there's a problem there. And there's a problem with these the geologists because they come to it with an assumption. They come to it with the assumption that the earth is millions or billions of years old, and so they outline the earth expecting the earth to show that. But if you come with the wrong assumption, if you come from the wrong standpoint and look at the levels of the earth, then you're going to have some problems. And they have some problems. I'll give you some other evidence of that. In the October 29, 1938 issue of Science Newsletter, there's another example of human-like tracks that appeared in stone. And they were a riddle to scientists. Now here is, that they showed a picture of these two footprints, and beneath these footprints, they very clearly said, these are not human footprints, even though they appear to be human footprints. They wanted to make that clear. And here's what they wrote. The footprints are exceedingly curious things. They are the right size to be human, nine or ten inches in length, and they are almost the right shape. Now, the reason why they say they're almost the right shape is because when people walk around without shoes on, their toes tend to separate a little bit. I don't know if my toes look that way or not, but I spent a lot of my childhood without shoes on, and so maybe my toes are a little bit like that. And so that's why they make that comment. It's because in countries where people don't wear shoes and they run around all the time with their feet, their, their toes tend to spread out a little bit, just the nature of that. And so that, that's the comment that they're making here. But they're trying to argue that they don't look human. They're trying to get away from this. He says, practically everyone who sees them thinks at first that they were made by human feet. And it is almost impossible to persuade some people that they are not. Now think about it. Everybody who sees them says, those are human footprints. And then he goes ahead to say, it's almost impossible to convince them that they're not. Now why are you trying to convince them that they're not? Because based on your theory, based on your method of dating things, they can't possibly be human footprints. Because this coal is 250 million years old, and man hasn't been around that long, and so it couldn't possibly be human footprints. You see again how the assumption affects the interpretation of what's found. Now, now science isn't supposed to do that. Science isn't supposed to have a preconceived idea and it only accepts the evidence that agrees with them and rejects the evidence that doesn't. Science is supposed to take the evidence, whatever it is, and, and, and to fit it into where it belongs. But not merely to throw away what 
they don't like and accept what they do or accept what agrees with them and discard anything that doesn't. Continues. A further puzzling fact is the absence of any tracks of front feet. Again, what are these geologists trying to, to find? It couldn't possibly be a man. It's too early for man. And so it had to be some kind of an animal. But we don't see any footprints, any front footprints. We know whatever this was had to be walking on all fours, but we only see two footprints. Again, they have a problem. The tracks, apparently all of the hind feet of biped animals, are turned in all kinds of random directions. At Berea, Kentucky, two of them are side by side, as though one of the creatures had stood still for a moment. Now think about that. Not only was this creature up on his hind feet, but he was able to stand still for a moment. Now isn't that amazing? That's 250 million years ago. And this animal stood up on its hind legs and was actually able to stand that way for just a moment. Do you see the assumption? Do you see the false assumption uh, that evolutionists come and examine the earth with and therefore they have to fit all that they find into uh, that model or into that, uh, that explanation? Consider something else. In 1891, a lady by the name of Miss Culp of Morrisonville, Illinois, dropped a shovel full of coal. She was on her way to the stove to cook something. When she dropped that huge chunk of coal, it broke open and inside was an eight-carat gold chain. Very, very well crafted. Now again, that coal is supposed to be 250 million years ago. So how did that chain get crafted 250 million? Who crafted it? Who made that chain 250 million years ago? Man wasn't around. Even man's nearest ancestor evidently wasn't around based on evolution, so uh, we're back even beyond the monkeys. But somehow, someone had the skill to be able to envision that and to craft that and make that and it's been preserved in this chunk of coal. How do you explain that? You cannot by evolutionary theory. You cannot by evolutionary dating. They're clearly wrong. Consider something else. In 1936, a metal hammer with a wooden handle was dug out of an area of limestone near London. Now, this limestone was not 250 million years old. It was only about 135 million years old. Now, how did a hammer get in this limestone 135 million years ago? Who was there around to use a hammer? 135 million years ago. Man wasn't around yet. He's not going to be around for a long time. So who was there around to hammer around and make things? Even make the hammer before you make things with the hammer. Who was around to do that? Well, again, evolution doesn't have the answer to that. Evolutionary dating is clearly wrong. Evolution contends for an old earth. It has to because they understand that men simply will not accept that this happened unless you can stretch the time out beyond man's ability to grasp that much time. And if you can stretch man's imagination to where he can't even imagine 4.5 billion years, then you can pull something over on him that otherwise you couldn't pull over on him. I want you to think about something. And it's just a, a characteristic of our age. You know, everything we see, everything we hear is the best that's ever been. I don't know about you, but I get aggravated with that. Every basketball shot, every dunk, every whatever is the best there's ever been. There's never been one like it. Every championship, every team is better than every team that's ever existed before. That's just a mark of our age. And I can't help but to think that that kind of exaggeration and that kind of having to have the, the very best of everything doesn't somehow fit back into some of this exaggeration that's been being done for generations. You see, it's more impressive for the earth to be 4.5 billion years old than it is to be merely 6,000 years old. 6,000 years? Well, well... Well, that's not too impressive, is it? It's only been here a little while. 6,000 years, that's nothing. 
Oh, to be significant, to be important, it has to have been here a lot longer than that. You see, man's pride and man's arrogance wants more than what it actually is. How do they arrive at some of the dates they do? And we don't have time to get into this tonight, not the purpose of this lesson. But it's very interesting to consider the circular reasoning that is done within evolution. How old is that rock? Well, it is so many millions of years old because it contains this fossil. Okay? How old is that fossil? Well, it's so many millions of years old because it's found in raw, in this rock. So they date the rock by the fossil and the fossil by the rock. You know what you can do if you date things that way? You can make them as old as you want to. The rock is as old as the fossil. The fossil is as old as the rock. And so you date one by the other. You just go, you just chase your tail. You just go in a circle. That's what evolution does. That's the way it dates things. You need to be aware of that. And so when, when you, you come across something that says the earth is 4.5 billion years old, don't just accept that. On, on, for surface value, don't don't just take that in. You realize that there are people who read in books that the earth is millions of years old and they do not know that they are being taught evolution. They don't understand that that's what that's saying. They don't understand that when you read of millions or billions of years, you're not talking about this anymore. You're not talking about what this book says anymore. You've left this book, you're in a different book if you're reading about millions and billions of years. Because this book didn't talk about that. Charles Darwin talked about that, but Jesus Christ didn't talk about that. And so to say, I, I'm not being taught evolution, if you're being told millions or billions of years, you're being told evolution. That's what that is. It may be subtle. It may slide it in through a back door. They, they may try to make it go across in such a way that you don't really notice it. But nonetheless, that's what it is. You can see it on cartoons. You can see it in children's books. You can see it all the way up. It's very subtle. Millions of years old. Millions of years old. Millions of years old. And by the time they get into that science class, they already believe. That's millions of years old because Barney told them it was. Because the Flintstones told them it was. Because the Planet of the Apes told them it was. Because Arthur told them it was. Or any host of other things that they've been exposed to. Evolution contends for an old earth. The Bible, on the other hand, contends for a young earth. You see, the Bible and evolution cannot be harmonized. They won't fit together. And to attempt to put them together is to destroy the Bible. Because the Bible won't fit. You have to break it to put it together with evolution. You can't make it fit without breaking it, without perverting it. Let's consider what the Bible has to say about a young earth. Now, we've already noticed that evolution says that there were millions of years between the earth and man's appearance on the earth. But what does the Bible say about that? Do you realize that the Bible says that the earth and man were made the same week? Read Genesis chapter 1. The earth and man were made the same week. They weren't separated by billions of years, or even millions of years, or even hundreds of years. They were separated by mere days. They were made the same week. In fact, Moses in Exodus chapter 20 is going to use the creation week as the pattern for Israel's week. Six 24-hour days, literal days, were involved in the creation of this world and of everything in it, including man. All made the same week. How different that is from evolution. How much time do we need? Do we need millions of years? Do we need billions of years? Not if you have an all-powerful God that can make things by merely speaking them into existence. You don't need that much time. In fact, you didn't need the amount of time that it took. 
Why did God take six days to do it? Could He not have done it in one day? Could He not have done it in one minute of one day? Could He not have done it in one second of one day? Absolutely. Why did He take six days to do it then? That's going to be a pattern. God likes patterns. Read the Bible and look at how many patterns God has given man. He gave man a pattern. He gave man a pattern later for the temple. He gave man a pattern later for the church. He gave Noah a pattern for the ark. On and on and on and on we see patterns that God's given. God gave man a pattern. He says, here's your pattern. Now follow that pattern. You work six days, you rest the seventh day. I gave you that pattern, God says. It's a pattern whereby you are reminded every week to remember me. It's a pattern whereby every week you're told to rest and spend that day worshiping me. God gave him a pattern. He didn't have to take that much time to do it, but he did. He had a reason for it. But the Bible suggests that the earth and man were made the same week. Now consider some passages, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. This, by the way, is the chapter that talks about the circle of the earth. This pre-scientific statement, scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. The time when men believed the earth was flat. Isaiah was writing that it was a circle. He was writing that it was round. Notice in verse 21, he says, Have you not known, have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Notice he talks about the beginning. He talks about the foundations of the earth. And he talks about what has been known by man from the beginning. What has been known by man from the foundations of the earth. Now, if it is the case that man is separated from the formation of the earth by 4.5 billion years or almost that much, then man hasn't known anything from the beginning. He hasn't known anything from the foundations of the earth. In fact, he's only known things for a short little while. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says from the beginning, from the foundation of the earth, that man has had access to certain knowledge. Why? Because he was made the same week it was made. There wasn't any separation in time between the two. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Here's a passage from the lips of our Lord. And I want you to understand that you cannot believe in evolution and in the Lord. You just can't. You've got to make your choice. You're going to believe in the false theory of evolution or you're going to believe in the Lord, Jesus Christ. You can't believe in both because He made statements that will not work with evolution. Notice what He says. He's talking to the Pharisees who are asking him a question about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He says in verse 5, Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. That's Moses writing these bills of divorcement. But verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Jesus said, from the beginning of the creation, How long has man been around? How long has woman been around? Well, our Lord said, since the beginning of the creation. You going to take our Lord's word for it? Or are you going to accept the column that's in your science book? Are you going to accept these layers of the earth that are said to be millions and billions of years old? Or are you going to accept what our Lord said about it? And by the way, who made man? Who was the Creator? Well, the Lord was. Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 8 through 11. God made everything by Jesus Christ. You don't think He knows how old this earth is? You don't think He knows when man appeared on this earth? Man appeared on this earth the moment that He spoke Him into existence. He knows when that is. You have to accept His Word or you have to accept the Word of pseudoscience. But you cannot harmonize both. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. We've already noticed this passage, so we'll just read it, make a very quick comment, not go into all the wording of it. But Paul makes the same argument that Isaiah had made, that Jesus made, 
in talking about man being around since the beginning, says in verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice that these invisible things of Him have been seen for how long? They've been seen from the creation of the world. Now, who was there to see them? A rational being called man. That was who was there at the very beginning to see. You see, man has seen this since the beginning of time. Why? Because man was there in the beginning of time. Adam looked on these things. And with his mind that God gave him, he was able to reason certain things from the foundation of the world. And since that time, man has been able to examine the evidence and make certain logical conclusions from it. That has not changed. The Bible says that man's been around since the very beginning. But consider something else. Luke chapter 3, Luke, the beloved physician, records the genealogy of our Lord. And Luke goes from Jesus all the way back to Adam. And I'm thankful that he did that. Because in doing that, he laid out a long line that we can follow back to the very beginning. He laid out the generations from Adam all the way down to Jesus. Now, in our day, it's about 2,000 years back to Jesus. From Jesus back to Abraham is some 55 generations. Secular history as well as archaeology will confirm that that's about 2,000 years. And so about 2,000 years back to Jesus. By the way, we say A.D., right? We divide time based on Jesus Christ. And so we have evidence for this 2,000 years back to Jesus. We have the evidence from Jesus back to Abraham for about 2,000 years. We're all the way back to the time of Abraham. We've only used up 4,000 years. What about from the time of Abraham back to the time of Adam? That's only about 20 generations. How much time is involved there? Well, Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11 tell us about those patriarchs and it records how long they lived. And so we're able to take those patriarchs and we're able to take the record of how long they lived and decide how long those 20 generations were. Well, someone says, there are huge gaps in those genealogies. You can't just take this, what Genesis chapter 5 says or Genesis chapter 11 says and really get a good date off of that. There are just some huge gaps that are there. Well, we know at least for the seven, first seven generations, there are no gaps. Because Jude tells us that Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and that matches up with what Genesis tells us. So we know for the seven, first seven generations that Enoch confirms that we're right. So that only leaves 13 generations from Enoch to Abraham. Those 13 generations, how many years could we possibly get in 13 generations? Now, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that the lifetime of these patriarchs tended to be rather long, right? Methuselah, he lived 969 years. Adam lived over 900 years. So there's, there's long time periods involved in here. But you know what you find happens following the flood? You know what happens to the age of man? It heads down in a hurry. We don't know all the reasons for that. The, the reason why we believe that that happened is we, we, we gather from what the Bible tells us that prior to the flood, the earth must have been watered by a mist. And so when God told Noah that there was going to be a flood, it took a great deal of faith on Noah's part to believe what God was telling him. He'd never seen that much water before. The Hebrew writer says, being warned of things not seen as yet, move with fear. Evidently, there was some type of a water vapor canopy that covered the earth. 
And then when God opened the windows of heaven and broke up the fountains of the deep, that water vapor canopy was removed. All the water that was in that canopy came pouring down on the earth. Now that water vapor canopy served as an ozone type of layer, protecting the earth, preserving the earth, making the earth a tropical paradise like what we read about in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It protected man from the harmful rays of the sun. But when that canopy was removed, the sun came pouring through. And so today we worry about skin cancer. Today we worry about problems that Adam and Eve didn't have to worry about. They weren't faced with those same issues. And so we see the age of man begin to decline rapidly following the flood because the earth has so changed as a result of that catastrophe. So my point is this. Based on what we can gather from those genealogies of Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, we're probably talking about 2,000 years in this period as well. Twenty generations making up 2,000 years in comparison to 55 generations making up 2,000 years because of the lifespans being so much longer during that first 20 generations. But again, in the middle of those 20 generations, things begin to decline. Following Noah, things begin to decline. They begin to tell off they're not as long as they had been prior to that point. So, 13 generations. How much time? Let's say that we double the time. Let's say in those 20 generations that we put 4,000 years in to the first 20 generations. It's doubling what was true of 55 generations following or from the time of Christ all the way down to today. Let's double them. We're still only at 8,000 years. Let's triple them. We're still only at 10,000 years. Right? That's still a relatively young earth, isn't it? That's why we generally say the earth is between six and 10,000 years old, even allowing for some time among those genealogies. There's no way to get millions of years there. just can't be put there. The earth is young. There's no arguing about that. If you believe the Bible and if you accept what the Bible has to say about it, we are living on a young earth. Bert Thompson suggests that there are three ways, three times, where men could possibly get time into the creation week. They could get it in before the creation week, they could get it in during the creation week, or they could get it in after the creation week. And man has attempted to get time into all of these periods. Before the creation week is what we know as the gap theory. It is the idea that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there is a gap. And you can throw all of these years that geology tells us are out there, you can throw them all into this gap. But you run into some problems. First of all, the Bible doesn't record that gap. There are some other problems. Because you have the earth being created and then being destroyed and then being recreated, and yet the Bible says that Adam was the first man. You also have the fact that the Bible says that Adam was given dominion over everything that was created, and yet if there was a whole creation made before Adam, that wasn't true. So many problems with that false theory. But also, if men can't get time in before the creation week, then men try to get time in during the creation week. And that's the day-age theory. That's making literally each of the days of creation into a long period of time to try to get the millions and billions of years in that way. We've already talked about the fact that the Bible simply will not allow that. The language of Genesis 1, Exodus chapter 20, other passages just simply won't allow that. Well, the only other alternative is to put the time after the creation week, which no one really does. Because they understand the need to have it either before or during, not after because they need to have it as, as, the, as the reason why everything was made, and how it came to be, and not after the fact. You see, you've got a choice to make. You can believe what evolutionists contend, and that is that the earth is very old, billions of years old, or you can believe what the Bible says based on the genealogies, based on the language of Scripture, that the earth is very young, but you can't believe both. 
You've got to make your choice. Which is it going to be? The fact of the matter is we don't need an old earth because we have an eternal God. We have an eternal God that spoke everything into existence. But the evolutionist needs time. He needs lots of time. But again, let me remind you that time alone will do nothing. You can, you can pile up boards and bricks and stone and you can guard that stack and you can let that stack sit for a thousand years. A thousand years from now, men are not going to walk up and see a house out of those blocks and bricks and boards. It just won't happen. You can wait 10,000 years. Nobody's going to walk up and see a house out of those basic raw ingredients. Why not? Because time alone won't build a house. If time alone won't build a house that is far less complex than this world, then time alone won't build this world. It takes more than time. It takes a creator. It takes an intelligent designer. It took our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight, we invite those that are here to accept the evidence presented in the Word of God for how this world and all that is in it came to be. Believe that God is. Come to Him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Repent and turn away from your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess Christ as the Son of God. Again, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Come to God in simple, trusting faith. Reject the false theories of man, whether they be those of atheism or those of denominationalism. Accept simply the truth of God's Word. If you are a child of God, we invite you to come through repentance, confession, and prayer to be restored as we stand and as we sing.